This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of the Green Party executive, commonly known as GPEX. Now, members of GPEX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm going to be joined by one of the candidates in the running for the Equality and Diversity Coordinator position. Before I introduce them, though, I just have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So with that out of the way, and without further ado, I'm delighted today to be joined by Kelsey Trevitt and Rhea Patel. You'll notice that that is two human beings. They are one candidate standing as a job share. So first of all, Kelsey, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm well. It's nice and sunny where I am, uh, so I'm happy and I'm good. Thank you. Brilliant. A, a slight break from the rain, which is always good. And Rhea, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm also doing good. It's it's not as sunny here, but I'm still good. <laughs> Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a series of questions to you and it's up to you whether both of you want to answer each of them or one of you wants to answer some of them. So we'll see how we get on. But to kick off nice and straightforwardly, I thought I'd just ask you, why are you standing to be the Green Party's next equality and diversity coordinator? I'm happy to jump in first on this. Um, thanks so much for the question. So yeah, so um, Ria and I are running um, to become the Equality and Diversity Coordinator on GPEX. And I think the, t the two sort of main things I want to touch on here are, are what we're running for, as you've asked, and also why we're the people to do it. Um, and so I'll, I'll touch on the first perhaps, and then Ria can jump in on the second. Um, but the first is 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 really kind of pivotal um, to the Green Party. We're heading towards um, election season uh, next year with, with massive local elections and general elections. Um, and we're really proud of the fact that throughout our recent election history um, and for our policy process, social uh, justice is uh, is intertwined and is as important as climate justice in the Green Party's policy platform. We know how important that is. We know that it's, it's vital uh, to achieving climate and social justice is centering the voices of traditionally marginalised communities. And for us as Equality and Diversity Coordinator, if we're elected, one of our priorities will be to work really closely with um, self-organised groups, liberation groups uh, within the Green Party of England and Wales, whether that's to uh, work together to form new policy, to make sure that we have a truly inclusive party that puts those communities front and centre at all times, whether that's forming special manifestos um, for liberation groups that are particularly focused on uh, issues of intersectional liberation um, with each of our, our liberation groups. And whether that's making sure that our, our rhetoric about social justice being um, uh, intrinsically connected to climate justice is more than rhetoric, we need to make sure that it's actions. And I think both internally and externally, um, we have a lot of work to do to promote that and to make sure that it's true at all levels. But I think uh, we're the people um, who are best placed to, to get that work, um, not only moving, but also um, towards kind of completion and, and reality. Yeah, and I guess, why are we the best people? Um, we've got lots and lots of experience. Um, so uh, Kelsey has been the co-chair of Young Greens for two years and has this year been the Equality and Diversity Lead as well on the committee. Um, I am the Equality and Diversity Spokesperson for the Green Party um, and I've co-chaired LGBTQ plus Greens for two years and currently now I'm um, still on the committee but as the Liberation Officer. I've also been on the Jacob Fund board. Um, so I previously used to chair the Jacob Fund, but now I'm just a, a board member. Um, so the, let me just explain what the Jacob Fund is, because I'm not sure if people are familiar. But the Jacob Fund is a fund um, that was set up after Jacob sadly um, uh, passed away. He was running to be uh, the candidate for mayor in Manchester uh, and, and was a black a man um, and the fund now exists to support people of colour um, both internally um, and externally um, in elections um, so that's through money or through um, other support that we could offer um, and also I am a councillor in Croydon um, so I represent Fairfield um, which is a town centre in Croydon um, I know what it's like to be elected and to put kind of our policies into practice um, in a local sense. Um, and so pushing for equality and diversity locally has been something that I've been doing. So recently, for example, this week, um, I asked the mayor of Croydon about uh, what he was doing um, for LGBTIQA plus issues, um, specifically trans and non-binary issues. So um it's non-binary awareness week and so 
I, I wanted to, to ask what, what the mayor was doing on, on those issues. Um, his, his response was quite lacking, um, but I could all continue to push him on those equalities issues across the board for everybody. So I wanted to ask you now, what you think are the big issues that the Green Party needs to tackle when it comes to equality and diversity? I'm happy to jump in first again. Um, I think for me, um, there, are, there are issues that we need to tackle and, and there's no surprise for any of that. And the biggest one for me um, is tackling uh, the issue that the Green Party has with transphobia. And I think that's, that's um, I'm really clear about how we describe that. And I think it's really important that we describe it in that way. It's a, a challenge that we face in tackling transphobia within our party and it's reflective of broader society as well. Um, we've seen how, um, how toxic um, and how much the culture war has been whipped up around uh, trans and non-binary people um, in the media, in mainstream politics, and sadly our party isn't immune. And I think that's one huge, huge challenge that we we really have to address and we really have to get right. Um, not only is, uh, you know, the Labour Party and, and the Conservatives um, failing on this, but even within the left, we're failing to uh, take a really quite, quite straightforward, quite natural and quite obvious line on um, securing not just trans rights, but trans liberation. Um, I'm really proud of Green Party policy on um, trans rights, and I'm, I'm really proud of the work that, that Ria and I both did um, starting a couple of years ago around the conference in 2021 to make sure that um, we had policy for the self-ID of gender, and we both worked really closely in coordinating that work and making sure it, it passed. Um, but I'm, I'm really keen that having policy is, is, is one thing and is really important, but making sure that um, we have our own house in order and our internal party is trans inclusive and a safe space for trans and non-binary people is incredibly important. And I think whilst um, there was space at one time, I imagine, for, for kind of discussion and, and mediation, we've got to a point where um, no amount of, of sort of nice discussion between um, people, you know, trans and non-binary people like myself um, and people who fundamentally want to want to take away our rights, want to take away um, our ability to, to live to live our lives, um, you know, in the way that, that is appropriate and as we want um, and as ourselves, no amount of, of discussion is gonna, gonna, gonna fix this. Um, we need a, a massive culture reform and we need to make sure that we aren't putting trans non-binary people in positions where they are uh, feeling threatened, left uncomfortable, or having to legitimise our like our very fundamental rights. That's just not a situation that anyone should ever ever be in. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of safety of of trans and non-binary people, we want we want to prioritise that as a as a party. I think. Um, but also there's other issues within our party and we're, we're aware of that. So, for example, in terms of race um, and having people of colour being representative um, of the kind of, the, the, I guess, our candidates that we select being representative of the areas that they come from. Um, so um, I've put forward a, a motion um, to conference this uh this autumn conference um to to try and rectify that um and uh kind of create a level playing field for those who are more marginalized um so that's disability women um it's still um women uh, people of color um I think I included care leavers I'm not sure I, it's still a work in progress and um it all needs to be ironed out because it's only just the first um, agenda deadline that's coming um but yeah making sure that those candidates we select actually do represent the areas that they come from um is a real priority because how can we have such fantastic policies but then not practice what we be preaching um yeah I think also there's a a potential um in terms of upskilling um those who are more marginalized within the party to, to take on more uh leadership type roles um because uh those who who tend to organize a higher level within the party so i'm talking about uh, the green party regional council the green party executive the leadership tend to be um uh, white people um there's some diversity in terms of like lgbt side of things um there's some diversity in terms of disability so it could be better definitely um 
but yeah I think we could be doing more to support um our uh, pe people of color within the party to to do better basically and, and achieve more um and and sometimes that takes more encouragement and more you know poking and discussions but it's worth it because um often you question yourself um and and think you know what there are other people who are good and better for this role um than I am but in reality maybe you are the best person but you just you can't you don't have the confidence to put yourself forward and so you need a little bit of encouragement from the outside and so that's something that we could be doing a bit better as a party um both locally but then also for national um uh roles as well just um also to add at the end the other thing that i, I feel really passionate about and, and i totally agree with you on all of this obviously but um the other thing that we could be making our our national and our local structures more accessible for disabled people as well so making sure and that that's a, a really wide range of people right so if that's people with physical or sensory disabilities um like like myself i'm, I'm completely blind uh, people who are neurodivergent making sure that uh, pathways into getting involved in the Green Party are accessible and understandable and, and sort of um, there's a really broad spectrum of, of things that we can be doing there, but also um, making sure that there's a dissemination of good practice and of training and of learning from one another about how we can um, get these things right. So whether it's thinking about how people can contribute to uh, local campaigns, community organising, election work, uh, political education style work in different ways, because people are going to be able to um, contribute in a, in a wide range of different ways and making sure that that's really clear, but also making sure that um, the structures are accessible and easy to understand, making sure that meetings take place at times that people can attend. I've seen so many local parties question why um, they don't have, for example, young people or disabled people or a particularly diverse group of people coming to their meetings. And it turns out that they're holding them at 3 p.m. on a weekday. And it's like, well, this, this, this might be something to think about. Or it's upstairs in a building without a lift. So no wonder there's no disabled people coming. And to me, that's that's fairly obvious. But of course, making sure that we have these learnings between parties and that good practice and training is disseminated and accessible is super, super important to, to adding to that diversity. And that filters through to uh, our candidate pool when we do selections, it, it filters through to people taking up leadership positions. It all matters that that people can can find a way to get involved in the first place or else we're never going to get it right. So two of the areas that you've talked about there are areas that I wanted to pick up on in a little bit more detail. So, and the first of them is transphobia and the second of them is racism. And um, so on, on the former, um, Kelsey, in your, in your kind of um, comments there, you talked about uh, there needs to be a complete cultural reform of the party when it comes to tackling transphobia. Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, thanks so much. I'll, I'll pick up the first list. I'm sure Ria has stuff to, to add as well. Um, but yeah, we do need a massive cultural cultural reform of the party. And there's so many elements to this, and I, I will be unable to touch on them all because there are so many. But the ones that, that spring to mind immediately um, are a reform of our, of our understanding of what transphobia is. So making sure that it's really obvious within our complaint system, which itself needs a massive overhaul. Um, we've seen the backlog that, that exists, and we've seen um, frankly, that it's, it's not functioning um, particularly effectively at the moment, but making sure that people involved in that have an understanding of what transphobia is so that when it does crop up, because we're in a situation where inevitably um, we have uh, examples of, of transphobic abuse and harassment uh, online, in person, um, making sure that it's really clear what that is and people can take a really strong line. There's a really clear definition uh, and a really clear understanding of that definition as well so that when transphobia um, takes place it's not a you know a divisive a divisive kind of question it's really clear that something is transphobic and we can take a meaningful action on that that means making sure that um, trans non-binary people who are on the receiving end of that aren't continuing to be threatened or feel at, at risk or harassed by um, people who are who are threatening um, their rights or their safety um, as I say, online or in person. So that's one thing that, that needs to change. Obviously that doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen um, on its own either. So another part of this is disseminating, as I've said about disability before, good training, good awareness. Um, and I'm really like pleased and, and, and proud of what the LGBTIQ plus Greens have done uh, in the last sort of year to 18 months about talking to local parties, um, especially and, and region, regional groups. Um, 
about what kind of trans inclusion looks like and what kind of our policy means and how they can um, engage that in practice and in their own local structures. And that's something that I want to not only um, continue, but also broaden. So making sure that it's not just left on the shoulders of um, queer people and trans non-binary people, making sure that understanding is disseminated um, and that it's clear to all local parties what, what that means and what they can do um, to tackle the, the issue. And then finally, I think the cultural shift involves, um, frankly, our, our, our leadership. And I, I mean that in the most holistic and sort of broad ranging uh, way possible whether that's our elected leaders, people on GPEX, um, like hopefully myself and Ria will be, uh, people on GPRC, the regional council, um, taking really strong stances on... It seems Carlty has cut out there, but I, I can guess that they are saying taking really strong stances on transphobia and... Um... Additionally marginalised group who are being um, un, under... Um, under threat and under attack and we need to make sure that we're strong on that i feel like my internet may have cut out slightly there so let me know if you caught that it did cut out slightly but i think we got the message um Ria, um, was there anything you wanted to add on that um yeah just in terms of these inclusion workshops i've really enjoyed um doing them i think it's it's um i've kind of brought along other members of lgbta plus greens and um kind of trained up people on how to deliver these workshops and it's been a, a definite learning experience but it's opened up conversations and questions um which has been really beneficial but also at the same time acknowledging that it can be really taxing for um a queer person to be delivering these workshops and maybe there needs to be some kind of support from national uh level there um just because even though it is a, a really worthwhile task to be doing, um, it can open up questions which, um, you know, challenge your identity and who you are as a person. And that can be quite emotionally taxing, um, not just to me, but other people who may be delivering these uh, workshops too. So support nationally would be really, really good. Um, also, um, the, oh yeah, sorry, Rhea, go on. Obviously, Kelsey just touched there on the complaint system. Um, absolutely, that needs um, some reform. I mean, the complaints that have been sat there for a really, really long time um, and need kind of, to be addressed. But then also down to like the more granular detail of like, you know, how is the mediation happening? Um, who is that happening between? Um, is it appropriate that mediation is happening between, you know, a trans person and someone who's you know been transphobic towards them um or someone who's been racist towards you know someone else and is that is that an appropriate way to deal with a complaint um I think that's a big question um to to you know think about um and address um but then also even more granular like when we're sending out um the information that if someone has a complaint against you making sure that the person that's complained about you isn't included in the email um the you know the, yeah just just basic things like that so the complaint system overall needs uh, a a big big change so then the, the second area specific area I wanted to talk about was was racism and I interviewed um Kapensi Dennis the one of the other candidates standing in this role and um, they said that they believe that the Green Party at the moment is institutionally racist I wanted to ask you whether you agree that the Green Party is institutionally racist and if so um how does uh, the party tackle that yeah um I would wouldn't say that the party is institutionally racist but I would say that there are definitely in there are definitely racist actors within the party um or people who are individuals that are racist and that needs to be dealt with um I but I mean Kefense has the experience of being chair of Greens of Colour and and I think so maybe has a different experience and different understanding of these uh, issues as well um so obviously can't speak from from his experience um but there's definitely been situations and and times where racism has come up or I've heard of, about racist situations and that definitely needs to be dealt with um and again uh through the complaint system that needs to be overhauled and uh potentially thinking about having it be independent or 
I think there needs to be some kind of review uh, done um, by GPEX on the complaint system to, to look at um, all kind of potential solutions to this, um, whether that is making it independent or, you know, putting in more resources or staff time or, yeah, kind of there needs to be a discussion around this um, to tackle that um, because that would really help in, in these situations. But then again, training um, for local parties, especially parties that maybe are majority white um, and based in more rural areas, um, less metropolitan areas where there is more diversity and maybe just don't encounter uh, diversity on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and don't have discussions that we might have in metropolitan areas, you know, or like in schools growing up, or like in community spaces um, about these issues, but training should be provided so that they can understand uh, race issues and articulately kind of be able to talk about them and challenge when racism does occur, um, because uh, being able to, to have the knowledge to, to step up and call Call, call in someone and say you know what that's not right um really needs to happen um and it shouldn't just be done to people of color in the room to to stop that um everyone should be on it basically yeah just to add to that as well as as, as you sort of finished off there really like greens of color should obviously be front and center in helping to design and understand what that looks like but in the same in the same way as the lgbt across greens delivering workshops like it shouldn't be left to people of colour to necessarily always have to deliver this training and um, there should be additional support, there should be uh, a broad range of support available to make sure that it's not left on the shoulders of people who are uh, traditionally marginalised by these forms of oppression to have to always educate others about it. And so I've got one more question about kind of the portfolio before I move on to some of the sort of wider GPEX responsibilities. Um, and this relates to the Diverse Matters report. Um, so for folks watching, you may or may not be aware, but the Green Party released a uh, commissioned a report on um, equality and diversity issues in the party. Uh, about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago now. Um, and uh, that report has since been, been uh, written and uh, members will have seen an executive summary of that report that was emailed around to everybody. Um, and what I wanted to ask, and essentially that, that, that has a series of recommendations of actions the party can take um, to tackle end issues within the party. What I wanted to ask the two of you is um, what would you want to do as members of GPEX to make sure that, that the recommendations of that report are properly implemented? Yeah, so um, I'll take up first here. I've been, um, as in my role as, as Young Greens co-chair, I've been on GPEX for the last two years. And so I've sort of seen this through um, from when the report was commissioned to when we received the report and then the following action that's taken place so far. Um, and. I'm, I'm really pleased, like, first of all, that, that this report was commissioned, and I think the recommendations in it are um, the result of, of many conversations that took place um, from people across the party, and I'm really pleased that there was a thorough um, methodology behind it, and obviously that could always be better, but I'm really glad that happened. Um, since the report's been uh, released, there's um, been some action, so people will have seen that there's just been hired a new um, equity, diversity and inclusion um, staff member, which I'm really pleased about because we, we, as with so much of what, what Ria and I have said um, today, extra support and sometimes that comes in the, in the space of staff uh, capacity is really needed to implement this. Um, but I think what the executive summary that members will have seen and what the report itself kind of points to and highlights um, is this kind of culture change that, that I've kind of alluded to and, and talked about here today and making sure that um, the work that we do with, with equality and diversity centres, uh, liberation groups. And so for me, some of the things that I've really been pushing for um, whilst I've been on GPEX for the last two years, which we're finally beginning to see, are making sure that liberation group co-chairs are represented um, in the, the working group for the, the Diverse Matters report. Um, and there's been some kind of more technical issues about whether they can vote um, as non-GPEX members. But I think what's important is not only are we trying to achieve um, the recommendations of the Diverse Matters report, um, but I think the process that we, we enact in order to achieve those recommendations needs to itself be kind of reflective of them. So making sure that um, representatives of our liberation groups are in the room when these decisions are being made and have an equal, if not more important, voice than um, than, than GPEX members, because these are the people who are being affected by these things and who have the lived experience 
uh, and the experience within the party of, of what it's like to be at the receiving end of some of these um, forms of oppression. And that's really important to me. Um, and then also making sure that the, the Diverse Matters report is um, understood not to exist in isolation. So um, if we were elected, um, it's obviously within uh, RIA and, and my portfolio to kind of lead on this, but making sure that it's understood as with our understanding of policy, that um, issues of equality and diversity don't exist in isolation. It's not a tag on, it's not a, oh, and by the way, we need to do this diversity work. It comes into the fundamentals of everything that we do, whether that's internally um, dealing with, with structures. And I know there's a lot of discussion about um, structure reform within the internal uh, party at the moment, or whether that's externally and how we present um, you know, our policy. And we've done a really good job of, of making sure that when we talk about issues of uh, climate justice and climate change or energy or housing that we think about um, the impacts on, on different traditionally marginalized groups. Um, so it's making sure that, that understanding is, is filtered through into the internal stuff as well and making sure that when we're thinking about um, all the other kind of portfolios on GPEX, whether it's um, external comms, internal comms, um, publications, all that kind of that kind of stuff that equality and diversity isn't an extra to those things. It's it's integrated and important for all of those portfolios and needs to be um, at the at sort of front and center. And that's how we're going to achieve culture shift. That's how we're going to achieve um, a party that is truly and meaningfully inclusive and not just symbolically or tokenistically so. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and also in terms of policy making and making sure that all of our policies really are thinking about equity, um, diversity and inclusion as well. Um, I'll be honest, I think I've been a bit disappointed by the movement um, that's been kind of slowly happening with the Diverse Matters report. Um, so I understand completely that we cannot rush this process. It really needs to be meaningful and, and that's going to take time. Um, it needs to be, you know, it's going to be a massive piece of work it, it, it has to be effective and kind of in, integrate into all aspects of green party life um but i think we could still be moving at a quicker pace on these issues because they are affecting us day to day and they are so so important um to those who are most marginalized within the green party and, and wider society and we need to get our house in order basically um that so that being said I would like to have um to see more regular meetings so as Kelsey was saying um there's a subgroup that's set up representative of all the co-chairs that Kelsey's been pushing for um as well as some of GPEX members to, to think about this uh, diverse matters report and how the recommendations can be put into place I would like to see more regular meetings with the this subgroup um I'm not sure when the last meeting was. Um, I remember attending one when I was last co-chair, but I'm not sure if one's happened since. Um, and I find that really disappointing. Um, so yeah, more action. It needs to be front and center of, uh, of day to day um, work that's happening in the Green Party. Well, I just add to that as well. Um, I totally agree that like things aren't moving fast enough, but also, um, the, the other thing I kind of wanted to add in terms of, of that subgroup, which is is an important space and one that should be meeting so much more regularly. Um, I mentioned before about like leadership and how broad that that term can be and, and should be kind of considered quite broadly. But I do think in this situation as well, it's important that the liberation groups are represented and I'm glad that we've got, got there. And it's important that there are members of GPEX who are taking this seriously in that space. Uh, it's also really important that our elected leaders, um, and I think it, it needs to be across the board, so our two co-leaders and the deputy leader are consistently present, are consistently contributing to this process, and are consistently um, pushing for, 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 for kind of bolder and faster movement on this. And I think it's really important that um, not only for, for the for kind of the symbolism and the optics, but also to, to believe that this work is being taken seriously at the highest level of our elected um, structures that our leadership um, team are always present in those meetings, you know, almost without exception, obviously within reason, um, and that they're contributing and able to um, to push this work forward as well. I think that's so, so important. 
And so I said, um, I have a couple of questions now on the wider kind of GPACs uh, responsibilities before I move on to my slightly less serious questions that I like to end on. And um, so the first of my questions on the wider GPACs issues is around finances. So the executive is the body within the party that is responsible for uh, managing the party's finances and ensuring its financial well-being. So I wanted to ask you, uh, and I'm asking all the candidates, uh, what your experience is of uh, managing and overseeing uh, large, difficult, complex budgets. I'm happy to, to go first again. Um, I, I, so um, my experience of, of dealing with, with large, complex uh, budgets such as that of, of the Green Party and such as that that GPEX deals with uh, is having been on GPEX for two years um, and dealing with uh, with the budget and, and being kind of uh, increasingly more involved in that process as, as the two years have passed. And so um, I think that's the kind of most direct and relevant experience um, that that one could could offer in in that sense. Um, outside of that, I don't have a whole lot of experience um, dealing with with other kind of um, budgets of that scale and that size. Um, but I think I've learned a heck of a lot, um, sort of on dealing with the the GPEX budget, working with other portfolio holders to negotiate and to work uh, with them to get a budget that works. Uh, and obviously, that filters through as well to the last two years of me being Dan Green's co chair. Um, and the work that we do on GPEX with the Green Party budget filters down to the work that um, I've worked with our treasurer and our other co-chair, uh, Jane, on working with our own budget as well in the Young Greens and making sure that that's uh, feasible and viable and that we're sticking to it throughout the year in a kind of monitoring way. Um, so they're the, the two kind of uh, direct experiences that I have. Yeah, obviously I haven't been on GPEX before, but um, I do have experience managing budgets externally. So I'm a trustee of various charities, um, mainly medium, small, small to medium sized charities. So I'm a trustee of People and Planet, uh, LGBT Plus Network for Change and Croydon Pride. And so through those kind of charity uh, organisations, um, I've had to manage budgets and make sure that we're staying, uh, you know, balanced and making some kind of uh, a profit to keep things like pride going um but yeah th th that's kind of my experience it comes from more of a governance and a point of view um from charities um but it, it i think it's still very relevant and can be applied to gpex and of course i i had um experience as well whilst i was co-chair and um uh, of lgbt plus screens and also the day fund which manages um uh, a, a, a fairly large sum of money um, in supporting uh, people to get elected. So my final serious question for you is uh, the Green Party Executive is one of the two primary governing bodies in the party alongside the Regional Council, GPRC, um, and parallel with GPRC, GPEX has oversight over the party's political ambitions and uh, strategy. Um, I wanted to ask you what do you think the Green Party needs to be doing right now to ensure it can achieve its political ambitions and strategy? I think that the Green Party needs to get its own house in order, to be perfectly honest. Um, we absolutely need to be focusing on winning elections. That's our whole priority. Like That is the aim of the Green Party, right? To win elections. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that our uh, internal structures are functioning properly um, and that they are supporting our members to get elected um, because once they are elected, they then fall back onto the Green Party to, to support them and other members need to be there to support them in, in, in a diverse and equitable manner. Um, and having the, the knowledge uh, is, is kind of of a diversity and um, equity and inclusion issues is really important um, to apply in local sense um, but then also the structures within the party um, need we've already spoken you know about the complaint system for example that need reforming um, yeah that would be my one thing I don't know Kelsey if you have something else no I totally agree with, with all of that the other thing I'd say is that um, so all the things that we've spoken about today feed into this right and we've seen maybe I'm, I mean I'm obviously biased having coached the Young Greens for a couple of years but we can see what that looks like when we get it right so you know the Young Greens um, bringing elected councillors together to um, work on things collectively across kind of England and Wales um, so making sure that there's 
coordinated action people are working together and that that's because we have a strong structure um and we're we're lucky enough to have kind of budget that, that works and, and all those kinds of things and that's really important for me i think um if we're going to achieve our political ambitions of getting uh more councillors and, and ultimately more mps elected as well we need to have those those structures as we have said to make sure that um, we're not only growing our, our base of elected Greens, we're getting more activists involved. And that doesn't just mean knocking on doors or delivering leaflets. It means uh, online. It means running community organising events. It means um, all those broader things that people can, can contribute and can add to. Um, and then making sure that when we have got successful campaigns and community organising initiatives, when we have got successful elections and got people elected, that there are strong structures behind them to uh, coordinate their action across um, England and Wales to build that network, to build that network network of elected Greens, to build that network of activists supporting them, uh, and ultimately to to grow and to get um, to get people to get more MPs elected into Parliament uh, next year. So I promised I'll move on to my last serious questions. The first of which is, and I'm going to pick on Kelsey to go first on this one. What is your favourite and least favourite Green Party policy? Ah, uh, my favourite Green Party policy um, is our drug policy, actually, because I think it was really well evidenced and I, I think it's unique, but it's, it shouldn't be unique. It's so obvious and it's fantastic. Uh, my least favourite policy is probably, oh, this is really hard. Um, I'm going to say the ambiguity around um, our, our head of state, our anti royal position is something that I feel very strongly about, but I want clarity uh, on what comes next. And so it's my least favorite because it's not clear. I might, really? I might have to nick that. That's a really good answer. I completely agree with that, the ambiguity about like, what comes next. Um, completely agree with the policy, but then what happens? Um, that's going to be my least favorite as well. But my favorite, um, one of the reasons I joined the Green Party um, was because of the sex work policy that we have uh, about decriminalisation of sex work. I think it's so fundamentally important for the safety of sex workers. Um, the Nordic model is so dangerous um, and we cannot have that put in place in our country and advocating for decriminalisation is the way forward. Uh, what book has most in influenced your politics, Ria? Oh my goodness. I, I don't you can't see it currently because I've blurred the background, but I have a I love a lovely collection of books and it's now painful for me to have to pick one. I'm turning around to to read some of the, the books. Um maybe inequality in the one percent. Um I think that was a really good kind of articulate kind of way of explaining how much power the one percent has. Um, and how that, you know, has created so much inequality. Um, I'd recommend reading it for more insight. Such a strong choice. Um, yeah, uh, mine was kind of inspired by what Rhea just said because it made me think of it, was a book called uh, Revolting Prostitutes, which is also about sex work and about decriminalisation, but also looks to the kind of like, um, like more kind of work abolitionist point of view, which I just thought was fascinating. It's really inspired my, uh, my politics recently. That's a really good book, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Kelsey, if you were Prime Minister for one day, what one thing would you change? Uh, proportional representation for all elections at all levels. Kelsey's yeah. stealing my answers. <laughs> um, yeah, electoral reform. Uh, get rid of the House of Lords. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Ria, who is your favourite historical figure? Oh. Oh, my goodness. Who is my favourite historical figure? I've literally gone blank. Goodness me. We'll go to Kelsey first then, and then we'll come back to you, Ria, give you a moment to think. Kelsey, who's your favourite historical can figure? I, can I have a really loose interpretation of historical? Sure. Uh, my favourite historical figure in the sense that she's not Prime Minister anymore is Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. That's smart. And Ria? Uh, um, who can I say? Judith Butler. Judith Butler. I know she's a bit controversial, but I, I love the the work that she's done, and also the learning that she went on after writing like one of her first few books, and like the the ability to change her position over time really is important, I think, and learn from um, the experience of those more marginalised than her. Excellent. And my final question for you, starting with Kelsey, is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Uh, there are so many. Um, who inspires me the most? Uh, 
Um, oh, there's so many. I think what I have to say, and this, 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 like, this sort of there's a story behind this, but um, my involvement with the Green Party really started with the Young Greens 30 and the 30 that I went on in 2020. And the person who I remember so vividly from that and who I've worked, been lucky enough to work with since then was Rosie Rule. And so I think there's something quite inspiring when someone has has led you into this kind of uh, uh, this thing that has very much consumed my life for, <laughs> for three years. Um, and it's such like a bold and kind of vivid character as well. So Rosie. Yeah, similarly, kind of. Uh, Benali Hamdash has really been very inspiring to me um, and seeing him as co-chair of LGBTA plus greens was was really inspiring and he does such fantastic work there and that made me want to get involved in the Green Party so Benali. Rosie and Benali I'm sure will be very happy with those name checks uh, so uh, that's everything I've got to ask you um, thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us it's been a pleasure. Yeah thank you so much Chris. So that was my interview with Kelsey Trevett and Rhea Patel, one of the candidates as a job share for the position of Equality and Diversity Coordinator on the Green Party Executive. There are two other candidates in that election, Kefensi Dennis and Melissa Poulton. You can see my interview with Kefensi on our YouTube channel and hopefully I'll have an interview with Melissa, Melissa soon. Uh, please do um, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, so that you don't miss out on that interview when it comes out and that's how you can also catch the interview with Kefensi. And a few final things to say to you before you all leave. The first of them is please do let us know what you thought about this conversation in the comments down below. Whilst you're there, please do hit like and share the video on your social media feeds. If you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and help fund the, the interviews that we put out and all the rest of the work that Bright Green does. So that's it from me today. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all very, very soon.